So now I'd like to call up the panel from the Arizona Department of Corrections, and they will be discussing reentry from prison, what makes an offender successful. Good morning. Um, my name is Karen Hillman. I'm with the Arizona Department of Corrections. I am their Counseling and Treatment Services Administrator. And what that means is that I oversee our addiction treat our sex, our sex offender treatment, our addiction treatment, and sort of general reentry issues. There is a lot of preparation for reentry and programming that goes on in a prison that a lot of people aren't aware of. And so we're going to give you sort of the, I won't even say the 40,000 foot overview, I'm going to say it's like the 60,000 foot overview. At the end of the slide, you have all our contact information. We're always open to you contacting us if you have any more detailed questions. Hopefully at the end of our presentation, we'll have a little bit of time left over if you have any specific questions today. So I'm going to start. And OK, I may start if it goes ahead. While we're waiting, I do want to say all of those, all of you who do come into the prison to do these programs, we greatly appreciate your doing them. We have more need than we can meet, so volunteers and interns and students coming in and doing work really enhances all of our efforts. So kudos to you and a heartfelt thank you to you. <coughs> so let's get started. I'm going to give you an overview of our system. In the state of Arizona, we have 10 state-owned and operated prisons. And then we have an additional five prisons at which we um, house, uh, private prisons at which we house our offenders and we have oversight of. We have approximately 42,600 and change inmates. As you can see, we have a mixture of violent, non-violent offenders, first-time offenders, second-time offenders. Um, the violent offenders, the number you see up there, that's a combination of those who have current violent offenses, so someone who may be in on a current aggravated assault, and those who have a history of having charges and convictions of violent offenses. Um, just for your information, about 50% of those that are showing as violent offenses up there are actually in a current offense. So contrary to some mythology that's out there, we don't really house a lot of low-level um, drug offenders. I think in our system and in, in overall, we have about 2,000. Very few of them are the first time. Uh, most of them go through several diversion options under Proposition 200 before they get to us. So um, before I show the slide, I want anyone who can shout out, what do you think risk factors for recidivism are? What causes a person to return to prison? No job. No job, as I heard. Homelessness. Homelessness. Substance abuse. Substance abuse. No support system, lack of skill base. All of these things contribute. The number one risk factor is a history of antisocial behavior. Well, that's sort of a no duh, huh? If someone is, has a history of doing these things, odds are they're going to end up in prison. Okay. Second risk factor is antisocial personality. It's the same thing. If someone is at the point where they're diagnosed by a mental health professional as having antisocial personality, that means they're not following the general rules and norms of society. So it's no wonder they would end up in prison and no wonder they would end up keep coming back. The third is antisocial cognition. Now this is really important. And the reason why this is really important because this is where programming, whether it be any of the programming that we as a department do or the programming that you do, begins to really have an impact. We can't change their history. It's done. It's in the past. Can't change it. Antisocial personality some mental health professionals can do some work with them, but that's not so easy to change. But we can start to change the way people think and the way that they view life because what you think is going to determine how you act. And that's what gets a lot of people back in prison because their, their thinking is a little bit skewed and they keep making the same choices again and again. You've all heard the definition, definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results. So this is where a lot of our programming works with them on their thinking. And you're going to see me occasionally glance down here and, and push because I'm long-winded, so I want to give these ladies a chance to talk, so. <laughs> Third is antisocial associates, and I heard someone say who, basically who you hang around with. You know, that, that's the lesson your mother taught you when you were young, right? Who you hang around with is going to be who you end up being. Family, marital, that's a support. 
they have low, low um, family support, they're at greater risk. School and or work. So education definitely plays a role. Um, it is not the number one risk factor, but it definitely plays a role. Again, that makes sense. The more educated you are, the better decisions you're going to make, the more opportunities you have to work and support yourself in a legal manner. And leisure and recreation, that sort of ties back to the uh, antisocial associates. If my idea of a fun evening is to go get some drugs, get high, drive around and do graffitiing or breaking and entering, whatever it is, and that's what my friends do, that's going to happen. Even if I go out with the best of intentions, if I'm hanging around with people that are still doing that, I'm odds are I'm going to go back to doing it again. And substance abuse. So what inmate programming isn't? It isn't a cure-all. I wish it was. I truly wish I had my magic wand that I could wave all of them and just say, ta-da, you're fixed, you're never going to come back. One key component about any programming is that the person who you're giving the opportunity to has to take that opportunity, recognize the value of it, learn from it, and apply it. We can't make people change. We can give them opportunities to change. And fortunately, quite a few take that opportunity. Inside, we have a whole host of different programs. Um, we have our academic education, which is our adult basic, um, adult basic literacy. We have GED. We now have a high school. And they're going to be talking to you a bit about more our actual edu academic education programs, I believe, later this morning, so I won't get de detailed into that. We also have um, work programs. We have Arizona Correctional Industries, which Underneath that, we have a whole variety of, of unique opportunities. Those of you who are going out to Florence Iman have probably seen the huge corral with all the wild horses running around. Um, what the inmates are doing is a um, Bureau of Land Management. They're not allowed to, um, to slaughter any of the wild horses on, on the federal lands, but they're overpopulating, so they need to remove them from the lands. Well, once you remove a horse, what are you going to do with it? if it's a wild horse. So this program, actually, the inmates, um, and I don't want to say break in because they don't break them in anymore. They gentle them in, and they make them so that they're, they're usable horses. And then they're for sale to the general public. Um, Border Patrol buys them. And, and so this is a way to avoid slaughtering these horses. And it teaches the inmates some amazing skills. Um, and it gives them a chance to understand how to effect, even though it's a horse, how to effectively work and communicate with others. Because they learn that even though it's frustrating, because the horse may not eventually, you know, may not originally want to come up to you, and and cooperate with you, if you methodically work with them, if you're calm, if you're gentle, you get the results you want. We have uh, tilapia fish farm. We build, um, we repair swift trucks, it, variety of things. Prisons are like small towns. You name it, just about it, anything that goes on there. Um, we have treatment, my addiction treatment, sex offender treatment, and uh, mental health treatment. And then we have a variety of, of other opportunities. Um, we do cognitive restructuring, because again, earlier I said that's, that's where we can really begin to have an effect. And our correctional officer threes are the ones, they're our programs officers, and they're the ones who deliver that. And you'll be learning a little bit more in depth about that in just a few moments. We also have a reentry program, um, and this is just, Reentry begins basically when someone enters a, the facility. We start assessing them, we start planning, we identify their needs. But in the last six, seven months is where you really start to hit your stride, where you actually get down to the brass tacks of, well, what are you going to need? Where are you going to live? All those kinds of things. And so we have a class that helps the inmates identify that. Um, we have domestic violence class, cognitive restructuring, um, Courage to Change, which is the program we offer in our max management program. So our maximum custody inmates actually come out, do programming at programming as a group. Again, that's a cognitive-based program to help them identify their, any thinking errors they may have. Um, and then we have self-improvement. 12 steps is just about in every unit we have. Um, Girl Scouts Beyond Bars in our Prairieville. Um, the ASU reading programming. You know, that was put up there before I was invited to this. So you all know we do advertise this. <laughs> Um, and then we have the mandatory program at, AS, at, at the um, ADC that we do with the inmates. We, we have a variety of programming. When I said earlier, we have you know, academic education, we have treatment. There's some programs that an inmate is identified for 
through assessment and through their risk or recidivate, that we go to them and say, you need to be in this program, and if you don't go in the program, you're going to lose um, your phase level for your privileges because we've identified this is a real need for you, and if you don't get this, odds are you're going to recidivate. But we also like to offer a lot of programming that is um, just self-improvement so that they're choosing. Like the, in your reading program, that, that's a self-selected they come into. Um, so it's, it's a blend. Both work. You can lead a horse to water, as our director says, and if you tether him there long enough, eventually he'll drink. And that's what we say with our mandatory programming, that's what it's about. Um, and those are thinking for change. Yeah, we entry program, which is Merging Two Worlds, which is actually developed out of ASU originally, and the Courage to Change programs. And now I'm going to bring up Ms. Courtney Gotchek, who's going to tell you more about thinking for a change. Good morning. Um, I'm Courtney Gottschalk and I'm the Transition Program Coordinator for the department. And one of the things that I do along with Jen Weathers that will come up in a moment is we go throughout the state, we go to CODA, and we teach our new CO3s. And what that is is they come in as officers in the department and then if they want to, they have some choices. They can promote and stay in the security series um, and become sergeants and lieutenants and go that route. Or they can decide that programming is the way they want to go, which we, of course, think is the best way for them to go. And they'll go and do the education and the teaching and they'll become a CO3. One of the classes that she was talking about is thinking for a change. Thinking for a change is the first of the mandatory programs. They're given this program when they first come in. Um, the reason why we do it when they first come in is they have this real distorted thinking that they have spent almost a lifetime on. And they only know how to think one way, and they only know how to behave one way. So this might be the first time that we're making them really think through what they're doing and the reasons for what they're doing. Okay? And then if we can get them to change their thinking, we can get them to change their behavior. Um, the class is of, two, of 22 lessons, really quick, in my perfect world, and it doesn't always work that way because of the unit structure. We want them to do it twice a week. Um, they are given, and it's facilitated for, by the CO3, and they're given homework to do outside the class before the next class is started. I'm going to go over the role play in a minute. These are some of the social skills that we cover. Um, and they seem very elementary to you guys, I'm sure, because we start out with active listening and asking questions. And yes, there's a whole two-hour lesson on asking questions. But our inmates, for those of you guys who work with inmates, how well do you think they are? How good at asking questions are they? How good are they? Do they know when to ask the question? Do they know who to ask the question of? And many times we find our inmates don't. So we're going to break it down for them. And as if you notice, as you go down, it starts out pretty elementary and easy for them, listening, giving feedback. But it gets deeper and harder for them as we're coming down to preparing for a stressful conversation. That stressful conversation might be having to cut some ties with family or friends when they come out. So we're trying to prepare them as they work further through the class. Here's what we give each of the inmates every time they come in. This is an example of what they're handed. So it's a real breakdown, one through five. You're going to decide what you want to know more about all the way down to asking their question. It's handled like this each lesson. It's repetitive. And then the thinking report is about the question that they're asked. So I'll break it down real quickly. They come in, and they're going to pick who they're going to ask a question of. And let's say they're going to do, they decided, I'm going to get out, and I need to find out if mom is going to accept me home. And I don't know. I've, I've caused a lot of drama in my house, and I'm not sure if my mom is going to want me to reside with her. So there's their question. And as they work through the steps, when am I going to ask her? Am I going to ask her a visitation? Am I going to ask her through a letter? Am I going to ask her on the phone? Sometimes right there we can stop them. Well, I know that my mom works 12-hour shifts, and she works three days a week. She works three 12s, and she works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So on Wednesday at 6.30, when she gets off at 6, I'm going to call and have this conversation with her. Okay, let's talk that one through. Is that a really good time to ask mom if I can come live with her, right? So we're going to try to work with them as to when is the best time actually to ask mom 
if I can come live with them. And then after we work through it, we go back to the role play. And what that is, and this is where we get the most resistance, we have inmates, ha they have to act out or role play for the rest of the inmates and the facilitator how that's going to go in their mind. And the reason why we do the role play, and it's critical, is it's just like muscle memory for anybody. We do a lot of muscle memory in the department. We do care, right? If you go out and do CPR, that's muscle memory, so that when you're in the moment, it feels more familiar to you. So they're going to practice with us, and then the other inmates are going to watch them. And as they watch them, they're also going to give them feedback. And sometimes their best education is from each other. So then they're going to go back out to their cell, go back out to their house, and before the next session, they're actually going to put that skill into action before they come back. Does that make sense so far? So if they're working on that phone call to mom and we've already gone through all the steps, our goal and our hope is that before they come back, they have gone ahead and done that. And then the thinking report is something they're going to fill out based on how well they think they did. So the situation is, I can give you a real-time situation. The situation is a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago for me, my supervisor sent me an email telling me that, asked me if I could be here today, and I said, sure. And then today, and I thought, oh, it's something with the panel, and I'm going to sit here, and she's going to talk for 45 minutes, and if you have a question on thinking for a change, I'm going to answer it. I never thought about it again, and this morning I came in, she goes, okay, Courtney, so you're going to be speaking from X time to X time, and you're going to be talking about this, and um, I'm like, what? Okay, so there's my situation, so you can just imagine what my thoughts are. Um, I'll go with panic. She didn't say it to me where her thoughts were. <laughs> I'm going to go with panic. I'm going to go with, you know, she's talked several times at staff meetings about, will you please read my emails in their entirety? I probably should start doing that. So you're going to go through the thoughts, and then they're going to write down their feelings, how they really felt in the moment. And then they're going to write down their attitudes and beliefs. Where do we get our attitudes and our beliefs from? Anybody? Past experiences. Past experiences, right? And can our attitudes and our beliefs change over time? Sure they can, right? So they're going to write that down, and then they're going to come back into class, and as the facilitator, we're going to walk that through. We're going to work that thinking report through. That's thinking for a change. The other thing they're going to do is they're going to grade themselves on how well they think they practice that skill. And then we're going to talk about it, and then we go on to the other skills. Any questions on thinking for a change or how we, how we do it? OK, that's thinking for a change. Good morning. I'm Jan Weathers, and I'm the reentry re coordinator for Counseling Treatment Services for the department. I do anything dealing with reentry. We're going to talk today about Merging Two Worlds, which is the second mandatory program. It is based on resiliency. The inmates learn life skills. They end up coming away with a reentry plan that is based on what is perfect for them. And they really like this program because it's all about them. So it's done seven months before they are released. It is 16 sessions, and as Courtney has said in the perfect world, it's two weeks, two, two times a week for eight weeks, two hour sessions. Again, sessions vary based upon programming as far as the ability of space and all that kind of thing. Um, the curriculum deals with one facilitator handbook and then the student handbook. And the inmates get to take that with them when they leave. They also come, come away with a release plan that um, is based upon each one of the chapters. And so that gives them all of the resources that they will need for a successful reentry. These are the topics that are covered. And we figured these are some of the best that they really need for a successful reentry. Self-awareness, expectations and limitations, prepare for release. This is where we talk about dealing with how they can get the, the different documents that they need to have for employment. Finances, life skills, substance abuse, mental and medical health, relationships, support systems, education, employment, and resiliency. Now, the employment chapter is our most important chapter, and we start at the very beginning of the classes. Because the inmates need to know 
and become prepared on how to answer the felony question. They have to go through mock interviews, so they need to prepare for that. And they have to have a resume. So we start very early on. It is the largest chapter that we have. And then they go through mock interviews with the staff, and it really helps to prepare them for when they get out, how to answer the felony question, and how to do a good interview so that they can find employment. General reentry needs. Um, there are needs and there are barriers. Housing is something that is a big barrier within our country for ex-offenders. But the CO3s work with them. We really work hard not to release anybody homeless. Work with them to get the proper housing. <coughs> Employment, one of the most exciting things that we are doing now, um, we have partnered with uh, Home Builders Association, and we're doing hiring fairs within our different complexes that have the building skills, career, and technical education. And we're looking to do more partnerships with this so that the inmate actually has employment before he or she is released. I think that's really very, very exciting. We um, deal with our Social Security cards. We, give, we help to facilitate replacement Social Security cards about five months before they are released. They also can get either a replacement driver's license or a replacement state ID card, providing that they have all their fines paid off um, and we do not give them to sex offenders. We also are dealing with their health care, Medicaid. Upon release, the offender goes either to probation or to parole and then their officers, the probation officer or the parole officer, helps to facilitate they're applying for access. And then birth certificates. We're working really, really hard to bring that to fruition here in our system where the inmate can apply for their birth certificates and have them upon release. Because that's something very important for employment. The identity card is very important and then the social security card because we need all of those to gain employment. So. America is a land of the second chance. And when the gates of prison open and the path ahead should lead to a better life, we hope that Merging Two Worlds will help them to give them some choices. I really truly believe that the more choices one has, the more successful they will be. And a lot of our inmates have all gone through one path. That's all they've known. So if we can open the doors to their minds to see all of the wonderful opportunities that they have, we believe that they're going to be very successful. Thank you. Hello. Okay, got it. Here we go. Excellent. I'm Nikki Studer. I'm a community corrections manager with the Department of Corrections. And I just have to say I've been with the department almost 27 years. I worked on the inside and now I'm, I'm in the parole bureau. And the reason I say that is I've seen from the inside out and how much our agency is transformed um, with a, a focus on reentry. And there's a huge focus on national reentry right now. So um, the work that everybody is doing uh, to have that warm handoff from prison to the outside is pretty, pretty amazing right now. And, and we thank the community for being such a huge part of that. Um, so I want to give you a quick overview of community corrections and what I found in uh, doing a lot of trainings with the community is a lot of people don't understand the difference between parole and probation. Should I even speak to that? Does everybody know the difference? Okay, so quickly, um, we are a bifurcated state here in Arizona which means that probation and parole are separate. So probation falls under the courts. Um, and it's by the counties, so Maricopa Probation, Pima Probation, they're all separate entities. And then parole falls under the prison, um, so the Community Corrections Bureau. So the difference is like Maricopa Probation may have, I'm not sure what their numbers are, they may have like 90,000 um, offenders out on community supervision, but it's concentrated just to their county. So the difference for us is we've got our bureau is supervising offenders across the entire state. So it's not by county, it's the entire state. The reason that's really important to understand is that when offenders are released from prison, they need to have a plan in place of where they're going to live. 
So they may be incarcerated in a Tucson prison, but they want to release to live in Maricopa County because that's where their family and the resources are. So that creates some special, unique challenges for the prison system in identifying how are we going to make that happen, just because of the distance and, and the span of our supervision. So quick overview of the Community Corrections Bureau. Um, first of all, our mission is to enhance community safety and reduce recidivism. And we define uh, recidivism by two ways for us. One is that we want to um, reduce the number of returns to custody while they're on supervision with us. But the long-term goal is to reduce recid recidivism for the long-term, meaning assisting individuals in making that positive change in their life so they don't get involved with the criminal justice system again for the long term, for a better life. Uh, the landscape for us, um, the prison population at any given time, we have over 40,000 inmates in prison statewide. Community corrections, we have between five to 6,000 offenders on community supervision with us at any given time. We've got 150 staff in our bureau and about 120 of those do active case supervision of offenders. So average case loads could be anywhere from about 70 to 100 offenders, and that's based on their, um, their risk level. So um, the specialized case loads, I'm going to cover that really quick because that kind of falls under our structure. We determined that we needed to have some specialized units um, because we focus on evidence-based practices. We want to ensure that we're targeting the right offenders at the right time and plugging them into the appropriate programs that they need. And research tells us that if we over-supervise an individual, we actually do more harm than good. So we base everything on our risk needs responsivity model, and we've got a risk assessment instrument that we use during the intake. For us, it's called the FROST, um, and we actually just had that instrument revalidated um, by Dr. Latessa and University of Cincinnati. So we'll be, we'll be um, rolling that out over the next year. We're pretty excited about that. The reason that that is important is we needed to have it validated for our population. That instrument was validated for probation, but that's a little bit different than someone that's coming out um, you know, directly from incarceration. So with these specialized units, they're broken down into the electronic monitoring unit is a squad of officers. That's kind of more of your, your um, the intensive supervision. Those, uh, they supervise the offenders that have been convicted of sex crimes, dangerous crimes against children. They're all on electronic monitoring, which is required by statute. Uh, the legacy program is, it's no longer in existence in the formal sense but we still supervise based on that model. And what that is is there was a study done quite a while ago that targeted certain areas of the state that um, there were high-risk offenders returning to their same neighborhoods, high-crime areas. And so the philosophy of that is that the officers are much more engaged not just with the offender but with their families and kind of that community approach of the warm handoff and the wrap around, you know, the, the community um, wrapping around that individual to help them be successful and, and help them make choices. So we still follow that model. Sex offender coordination unit, that unit specifically looks at the statutory requirements of sex offenders, which could be registration, community notification, and they also process the sexually violent person's civil commitment, which could be a lifetime commitment for those offenders. Um, those folks that are civilly committed, they're committed to the state hospital for the purpose of treatment. It's not a punishment. Um, that statute is challenged repeatedly. Um, it's, it's viewed as like a double jeopardy, but the purpose for that is for treatment. And then the Warrant Service Hearings Unit um, that unit represents the department at the Board of Executive Clemency for the warrants that we, that we write um, to return offenders to custody that are in violation of their conditions of supervision. And then Interstate Compact, that is the federal agreement with all states that if someone is released from prison and they, ha and they require community supervision with us, and that applies to parole and probation, that they may be eligible to complete their term in another state. So if 
I'm released, you know, in Arizona, but my family lives in California, I can apply through this compact, and I would be supervised in California by the parole department there. Those individuals must comply with their terms of, of conditions of supervision in that state, as well as what we would require of them as well. And then sanction options. Um, so giving you a breakdown of an intake, what that looks like, when an offender is released from prison, um, there should be a lot of work done prior to, the, to their release, as was mentioned, in preparation of them coming out into the community. We want to make sure that there's a real plan in place. We want to make sure that we've developed a case plan for that person. You know, where are they going to live? Are they employable? Do they need some job training, job skills? Um, they need to have their identification to get anything done, apply for any type of services. So when that offender is released from prison, they meet with their parole officer on the day of release, and the officer will review their conditions of supervision, which is a list of terms that they must comply with, legal terms that they have to comply with, as well as the officer using that risk assessment instrument that identifies what their criminogenic factors are, what their needs are, and then really targeting what those needs are, plugging them into the programs that are geared to help them be successful. So if they have a long history of substance abuse, we want to make sure that we're plugging them into the right supportive programs to help them be successful and um, help them identify what their triggers are and make better choices for themselves. So during that intake process, they review all of that, they implement the case plan, um, and the risk levels also determine, and that was on the previous slide, the risk levels are minimum, medium, maximum, and intensive. And that's based on the risk needs responsivity, that instrument that we use. And um, based upon what their supervision level is, it really determines that contact frequency with the officer. So if they're minimum supervision, they'll see their officer less. And again, that goes back to the research that we don't, you know, we don't want, we don't need to have our thumb on them all the time. We actually do more harm than good. And those folks generally are the ones that have a greater likelihood of succeeding anyway. So if they're high risk or intensive, um, the officer is going to have more contact with them and um, provide them a little bit more guidance. So with the sanction options, um, we have what we call an intervention sanction matrix, and that's also based on research, um, that we want to identify what programs to plug these offenders into, and someone could be on supervision for a period of time and they're doing really well, and then all of a sudden they have a little hiccup, maybe they get a dirty away or something, um, uh, but based on their supervision level, we don't want to just hammer, you know, we want to make sure we're plugging them into the right program that's, that's going to help them be successful. So that matrix helps our officers identify what an appropriate sanction would be or intervention would be based upon their risk and their need and what their behavior was at that time. So the programs that we have are, uh, there's one that's not on the slide here and that's the transition program that is determined um, pre-release. It's a legislative program. The CAP program was legislative. Um, that sunsetted, but we adopted that as our own. And the Residential Community Behavioral Mod is also um, a legislative program, and they're funded by the Spirit CAPs. And um, these programs are extremely valuable for us. One of the big challenges, obviously, is limited funding and resources available to these offenders when they're released. So we're very reliant upon these to help us with those interventions. Um, quickly on those, they're sub, they provide substance abuse. Um, the CAP program also provides some additional accountability options, which would be GPS tracking or the TAD, which is transdermal alcohol detection. And that's also a, an ankle bracelet. Um, and nobody can beat this. You can't like slide a piece of paper there and. Basically, <laughs> everybody wants to volunteer for that. Um, but anyway, so there's the accountability measure there as well. Um, and then the program that we just started three years ago, and this is the, the new thing, you guys may have seen this on the news, is Department of Corrections is now venturing into providing the residential service for offenders that are out on supervision. 
So um, you've all heard of halfway houses out in the community for people that don't have anywhere to go. We've started our own halfway house on steroids. Um, so the Southern Region Community Correction Center is located in Pima County. It was a prison that we converted into a community correction center. And there's different program tracks available to offenders at that center. One is the Homeless Stages Program. And uh, the big value for us the day that we opened this center is we were able to bring in the homeless sex offenders that were living down in Pima County. They were homeless because of statutory restrictions that prevent them from residing anywhere. So these are offenders that were on supervision with us on GPS that we had no option of anywhere for them to live because of the nature of their crime. So we were able to pull them in, provide them a safe place to live, provide them job training and all of those other um, things that, that they require in order to be successful for the long term and keep them, keep them out of prison and hold them accountable at the same time. And then the day reporting, that's open to any of the offenders that reside down in that area. They can check in daily. Um, there's a lot of wraparound services provided at the center some job training, substance abuse, um, counseling, and, and a variety of other programs. Intensive treatment with housing. This is Karen Hellman's baby. Uh, it's a 90-day in-house treatment program. The counselors are on site. They are um, counselors that are under Karen's um, watch. And the sanction stays. That is based upon the HOPE model. It's kind of a hybrid, and that stemmed from Hawaii, where there was some research done that it's basically what we call an adult timeout. So if we have an offender that is in violation of their um, conditions of supervision, they haven't committed a new crime, but they're in violation of their conditions of supervision, and they're really just going down the wrong road. In lieu of returning them back to custody, this provides us an option to send them back to the center maybe for a, for a weekend or a short stay as kind of a reminder, you know, a timeout where they will work on um, a cognitive restructuring, like a thinking report, something to, to give them a timeout from their life and really look at what their behaviors are to really think about it and um, make some better decisions with some guidance down there. So that provides us a really valuable option. There is a lot of discussion about opening one here in, in uh, Maricopa County, which the bulk of our offenders being released from prison are coming to Maricopa County. So we really would get the, the bigger bang for the buck. Um, and then one of our specialized caseloads is the, the SMI caseloads. And this is a, a biggie for us right now because we have an increasing population of offenders with mental health issues some of those are designated SMI um, through Department of Health Services. And what that means is these folks, just like every other offender, has all of those challenges that every offender that's being released has, but they have some additional needs that really need to be met. Um, what we found is by training our officers to um, some of the nuances with mental illness, what that really looks like for that person, and then also navigating the community system is, that's a monster. Um, that by training those officers to work better with this population, um, we have a higher rate of success of those folks staying out of prison. And the reality is prisons and jails have kind of become the de facto mental health facilities because there's not a, a bolstered response out in the community for that population. So we've had um, some success with that, and probation has been been doing this for a long time as to uh, a long time as well. So we partner with them on that. Um, some of the options that we have with with our contracted programs is we are able to find some housing for these offenders as well, and that's a huge challenge. There's a lot of places that will not let these offenders reside, like at a halfway house, because of the medications they're on. They can't deny them placement because they're mentally ill, but they can deny placement because of the medications. And so again, we want uh, them to be in a safe place where they can reside and have the wraparound services from the community um, along with their trained officers to help them remain in the community and um, you know, have a successful life. And the forensic act teams, this is something that's 
fairly new, and this is amazing. Uh, Mercy Maricopa, which used to be Magellan. Uh, we've got the fact teams here in Maricopa County, and really what that is is the whole team approach. Instead of one case manager being assigned to one person to do everything, to do 50 different things and being an expert in 50 different things, you've got a whole team of people that wrap around this one person. And one of the individuals on the team may be the expert in housing. Somebody else is an expert with the medication. Someone else is an expert in the employment piece of it. So it's the full wrap for that person. Um, so that's pretty successful. And then navigators, it's the same type um, of process with that. It's one person that can kind of help um, identify what that one individual's needs are and get them plugged into the right areas. So last thing I'll talk about is our statewide recidivism reduction grant. Um, Department of Corrections is a very proud recipient of the second chance statewide adult recidivism reduction grant. We just received this. And um, what's exciting is of all the states that applied for this, seven were awarded the planning grant. And in order to be eligible for the three-year, $3 million implementation grant, you had to have been awarded this. So what we're planning to do with this planning grant is we're going to hold the statewide summit April 6th at ASU West. It's by invite only. Um, and what we're looking at is we're, we're bringing together the entire state of Arizona, key stakeholders, which includes government, but it's a lot of grassroots organizations because we recognize that the community um, grassroots are really the ones with the passion for a lot of this and then combine that with government and you, we've got to have this sustainability for that. So we'll have a one day summit for, for the top folks that were identified for this to really develop um, a state plan, identifying what the gaps and barriers are and then what some possible solutions are to reduce recidivism in the state of Arizona. And so it's not just Department of Corrections, it's anyone that's criminally justice involved how can we reduce recidivism for the state? And that is it. Thank you. And we actually have three minutes left, so good job, ladies. Um, before we turn it over to some questions, I just want to say, if, if your passion is to work with this population, welcome to the club. It's one of those things that people usually look at you like you have two heads when you say that you want to work with this population. They're amazing to work with. You see growth, you see change. They're fantastic. I will say, if this is your passion, there are a couple of, of, of researchers um, and big names in the criminal justice agency that you should, you should read what they write. Um, Ms. Suda um, mentioned one earlier. That's Dr. Edward Latessa, L-A-T-E-S-S-A. -S 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 He's done a numerous projects and research into this. He does a lot of meta-analysis of what works and what doesn't work and why it works and why it doesn't work. He's, he's an industry leader. Um, he's sort of the guru. So if you want to work with this population, please read some of his work. And another one is Dr. Stanton Samenow, S-A-M-E-N-O-W. And he's the guru of, of the idea of criminal thinking and the criminal thinking patterns and, and how you need to get at that. If you want someone to start making different choices, you need to get at their thinking and help them to change that. So I definitely recommend that you, you read some of their work. Some of it you may agree with, some of it you may not agree with, but um, it, it's, it, you need to be aware of it if you want to work with this population. And with that, um, I'll, if anyone has a burning question they wish to ask us. Yes, sir. I'm not sure it was on the early slide, but what is the overall recidivism rate in, in Arizona? How is it compared to other states? <laughs> Um, I'm going to say off the top of my head, last time we looked at a three-year recidivism rate, I believe we were at 39% returning within three years of release to our department. Uh, so right in line with national average. The difficulty with recidivism rates, and for those of you who are, are research gurus and, you know, and, and um, numbers people at heart, is when I say that three-year return to us, we have limited data sets. So if we have someone on community corrections, they, they complete, three years pass, we look at our numbers, they don't return to us, but they may move to Hawaii and, and get in trouble there and be in a prison system. So that's one of the difficulties with the numbers. 
one of the national initiatives is comes out of the National Institute of Corrections is they have what's called PBMS, Performance-Based Measure System. And now a lot of the correctional systems are dumping more of their data into it so that we can start to compare against systems of how, how we do, um, where we may be doing well, when we, where we may need assistance or, or to work on things. Oh. Um, but the, stop peeping at me, I know. Okay. Um, we're one of the, there's currently, of all the state systems, only 10 have completely Im implemented it, and we are one of them. Our director is very passionate about that. We want to start more and more making data-driven decisions. And I think that takes our time. So, Jessica, thank you all very much for inviting us here, for listening. We appreciate it. <laughs>